After watching the film Inspired to Ride years ago, French Canadian ultra bike packer Louis Eric Simard took on the famous Trans Am bike race, crossing 10 states in the USA, coast to coast, self supported. If that wasn't enough, Louis Eric is now on to his next big adventures, organizing his very own ultra bike packing events the race around Cuba and the Trans Canada bike race, which crosses Canada from west to east over 12,500 kilometers or 7,767 miles and climbing 319,000 feet or the equivalent of Mount Everest 11 times. Louis Eric is a successful entrepreneur and technologist, running his own software company and also creating his own bicycling products. And most interestingly, one of his favorite ride snacks is crickets. Don't miss this fun and inspiring episode. I'm your host, Justin Tu. Let's roll. Hey, Ultra family, Justin Tu here, your host today of the Ultra Cycling Show. Thanks for tuning in to today's exciting and special episode with our second French ultra cyclist and event organizer on the show, Louis Eric Simard. He currently resides in Toronto, Canada, and he's the organizer of the Trans Canada Bicycle Race and the Race Around Cuba, which is launching soon. Louis Eric also participated in the Trans Am bicycle race in 2018. So it's a real privilege, and it's going to be a lot of fun to have you on the show today. Thanks for joining me, Louis Eric. I'm a long time watcher. I look forward to this interview. It's going to be fun. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, it's been a lot of fun just chatting with you before we started this recording. I know you're involved with a lot and you have a lot of experience both in bicycling and other areas. And you are currently getting ready for your inaugural Trans Canada bike race, right? Yeah, in the middle of a pandemic. So it's a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, uh, gutsy, but uh, I can't wait to ride. So uh, I'm organizing the event no matter what, it's happening. And that's a fascinating thing that I'd love to get into more detail as we get going. You will be riding in your own event, and it is the inaugural one. It's 12,500 kilometers, 7,767 miles. It's 11 times Everest, which is over 300,000 feet of elevation gain. So that's incredible. What a challenge. But before we get into all of that and more, it's going to be very exciting. Let's start with our usual sprint round of questions. It's just a series. All right. Questions to get to know you.、Mm -hmm. So, Louis, of course, first question How long have you even been riding bicycles, and when would you consider that you became an ultra cyclist specifically?、Uh, I've been riding since I was a kid. And、um, the first time I, I rode was on a cobblestone type of road, more like loose gravel. And my uncle was showing me how to ride a bike that was probably a bit heavier than I was. Um, and um, I fell quickly. Um, and scraped my knee and just said, okay, it's fine. Just walked away. And,、um, and I, I really loved、uh, that, those few seconds. So I, I kept at it. And I've been riding、uh, most of my life. The,、uh, the first time that I, I would say I had a, a real good experience with ultra cycling、uh, was actually as,、uh, in my mid 30s or so. Uh, my younger brother, who lived、uh, next door,、uh, invited me to go watch a movie with him. And I said, Hey, I'll, I'll be there. I just want to do a short bike ride、uh, before I go. And、uh, it was on a, also a, a very heavy hybrid urban bike. And、uh, a few hours later, he calls me. He says, Are you coming out? Like, where are you? And、uh, I said, I don't know, but it says, Welcome to Ontario, which is the, the province、uh, on the west of, of,、uh, of the province of Quebec.、Um, and I'd ridden about、uh, 112 kilometers, I had about 35 cents on me and two pieces of candy.、Uh, so the coming back was a little bit、uh, difficult, but、uh, I really enjoyed it. It was fun.、Um, so after that, I joined a few、uh, uh, organized. Uh, long events.、Uh, there is something called the Grand Tour、uh, in Quebec, which is absolutely wonderful. It's a week of、uh, cycling with about 2,000, 2000 other cyclists.、Um, and I just enjoyed it more and more. That's so cool. Yeah, a great start to your cycling 
adventures and career. And of course, now you're preparing for your own races and not small ones on any scale. And mm -hmm. so very well done. Looking forward to hearing even more about how you got to where you are today. But next question I have for you, Louis Eric, what's your favorite bicycle and which one do you ride the most? Uh, those are two different questions. Uh, I really love the Southside Cutthroat. I find it so comfortable, so nicely aggressive, light. Um, like all the energy is, is strong into the wheels. You know, there's no flex, there's no waste. I love it. But it is for gravel races and I'm mostly a uh, road uh, rider. Um, so right now I, I ride the Trek uh, Domain 4.7. Uh, I don't know how we're supposed to say, is it Domani or Domain? Anyway, it's a Domain uh, 4.7. Uh, and uh, I love it. You know, it's a, uh, it's a mid-level bike. It's not like nobody will win uh, a Tour de France uh, with that kind of a bike. Uh, but it's, uh, it's plenty for me right now. Louis Eric, so I want to show folks some of the photos you sent through. There's a bunch of really cool ones, and we're going to get into all of them in more detail as we get going. But I did want to give a visual. Earlier, you also did mention you did that one ride in your mid 30s. So give mm -hmm. us an idea. How old are you today? I just turned 50 a few months ago. So uh, uh, I'm coming rather late into this. I did the uh, 2018. Uh, race at 48, and that was, you know, my first very long race. Um, I'd done Grand Gravel before uh, in the same year, and the uh, uh, Italy Divide as well. Uh, okay. So uh, I've always been looking for a sport that I could do into old age. Um, I had met a gentleman on the Grand Gravel 500 race uh, uh, with a beaming smile. He was, he was super old, uh, like a uh, uh, probably early 80s. Sorry for people who are listening and <laughs> they said super old, but uh, the guy had a beaming smile. He was uh, participating. It was, it was faster than, than most people. I thought, well, that's a cool sport to, uh, to do until, you know, the end of life, you know? Right. Yeah. And well, you're not alone in thinking that. We've had John and Nancy Guth on the show and many others who are in their 70s or 60s. And uh, there's no stopping them, it seems like. No end in sight. So looking forward to seeing you racing Trans Canada in the <laughs> 30th edition when you'll be 80. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll probably be uh, Lantern Rouge on, on, on that one. But yeah, <laughs> I'll enjoy doing it. Yeah, those who aren't familiar with that term, that is essentially the first, last place person. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. What bicycle computer do you use? Uh, the one I use, we, um, uh, I own a software company and I got so tired of Garmin and its numerous issues um, that we're basically building our own GPS. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's much better than, than what's on the market right now. But uh, so far what I'm using, because it's, we're still at the prototype stage, I'm still using the Garmin uh, 1030. Um, reluctantly, I would say. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. So you're definitely a man of uh, many tricks and trades and talents. <laughs> I'll just give you a story about the 1030. Uh, during the um, Italy Divide race, uh, the thing went berserk. It would not stop beeping. It would lose its tracks. And so what I did is during a meal at the, at the restaurant, I convinced the, um, the restaurant owner to loan me his only Windows computer he had in the restaurant, which was actually his cash register. So I could install a Wireshark on it, which is a tool to observe what's happening on the network. Uh, so I can figure out how the Garmin update was happening. So I could go and force patch the software to at least stop behaving um, in the most uh, disagreeable way possible. So um, that's not really a good uh, user experience with Garmin. <laughs> Yeah, and you're not alone with that, Louis Eric. Look forward to seeing <laughs> your product on the market. Uh, mm -hmm. when, when do you plan to launch it? The labor of love. So uh, I'm going to try it over uh, Trans Canada. Um, probably by next year, we should have uh, the device ready. I want it to be bikepacking specific um, as a device, so extremely long battery life. 
Um, I wanted to be able to also ping to satellites directly so that we don't have to also have a secondary device like uh, uh, one of the, of the gentry devices um, or, the, or the spot, uh, which is the common one. Um, so to basically have everything in one place, but also have uh, a battery built in that's basically a battery bank. Uh, so you can charge your devices as you go in the most efficient way possible. All right, cool. Where do we sign up for one? <laughs> <laughs> well, send me a, a message on Facebook and I'll put you on a mailing list for sure. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, on that subject, folks can check you out on Facebook. And also, of course, the Trans Canada Bike Race does have a nice group that folks can join if they're interested in participating. The, the race is uh, launching in June, if I'm mm -hmm. understanding correctly. That's right. Uh, June 21st is going to be the start of the race. We have uh, two categories for the race. We have uh, bicycles of any kind, and we also have a Velomobile race. Uh, Velomobiles are very popular. Well, very popular. They're more popular in Europe, I would, uh, I would say. Um, and um, it would be fun to have a good national event here in Canada. So they're racing along. Uh, the day pre prior, if people want to join for the touring so basically not being timed. Um, they have a shorter distance, well, shorter 9,000 kilometers. It's still uh, pretty lengthy, um, but it can do that. And uh, they're, uh, they're starting a day before everybody else. Wow, nice format, very cool. <laughs> okay, we'll get back to the race more as, as we get going here. Next question I'm wondering, when you're riding, of course, you're doing a variety of different kinds of rides, it sounds like. What size tire do you like using and at what tire pressure do you like pressurizing? Well, I'm a taller, heavier kind of guy. So 25s are not for me. It's just too uncomfortable. Uh, I ride 28s on the road. I ride 32 uh, on gravel. And usually I put the pressure to the maximum of the tire minus five points. Ah. So it gives me just enough comfort, but also I know like I can still feel the road, uh, which is super important when you zone out. Um, you know, you want to have this, this contact with the, uh, with the elements uh, without having all the pain uh, that goes with that. So, um, so I, I feel like it's a good intimacy with the road. Yeah, that's cool. I like it. Very calculated formula. We'll have to give that a try. I'll see <laughs> what my max tire pressure is minus five and see what magic I can Garner from that. <laughs> what gearing do you like to use? Uh, I'm a masher. So uh, I use the big ring in the back and uh, in the front and the 11 tooth uh, on the back for almost everything. Um, I've kind of assumed for most of, of my life that this is what people were doing in general. Um, but I went to a local bike shop and I said, hey, you know, I still have to replace my cassette. And the guy said, well, we you know, just re replaced the first few rings because you seem to be using the, those ones. But every other cassette that we receive, um, the middle and the higher uh, uh, two uh, numbers, uh, two numbers are the ones that people bring for, for repair. So we have plenty of small 11, 13 uh, teeth uh, cogs. So we can just basically put one up for a few dollars. I thought, well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Uh, with my coach right now, we're, uh, we're trying to convert me into riding at a faster cadence. Uh, but it's, um, it's an ingrained habit to, uh, to go around 50, 60 RPM. We're trying to go to 70, 80 RPM right now. Yeah, I know about that. Starting out, I, th I think perhaps like you said, we all kind of maybe start out with this, uh, you know, preconceived notion that, you know, you use the, the, the harder gears and you're really a gear uh, smasher like you are. And uh, I guess as you get trained, especially with coaches, the recommendation typically is on the higher RPMs. So look forward to seeing how that progress is made over time. Right. <laughs> Talking about that. So you do have a coach. I'd imagine you <laughs> train by time mostly and you're doing a lot of interval, intervals, those type of things using power and or heart rate. Yeah, uh, power. Uh, every bike has a power meter attached to it. Um, the, um, uh, the, the distances vary between 45 minutes and so far six and a half hours. Uh, Greg, Grand George is, uh, is the coach that I hired. Um, I've been knocking at his door for multiple years uh, because he has a, a certain number of, uh, of athletes that he can work with uh, to give them uh, the, his proper time and focus. 
and there was just no space on his roster at all. Uh, last October, uh, he finally uh, said yes, and I've been training with him ever since. Uh, he's a phenomenal coach. Uh, you uh, you ask him a technical question, and he's, he's 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 sending me emails that are pretty close to a scientific article with all the formulas and all the references and everything. It's, it's just amazing for for a geek like me. He's the dream coach for for what I'm doing. Wow. That sounds pretty cool. <laughs> sounds like a lot of fun working with him. So do yeah. you do an occasional, a functional threshold power test FTP? Do you know what that is or your power to weight ratio? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, the number I would, I, would, I would say is the one. So last year, uh, before uh, COVID was even an issue here in Canada, I got COVID and it destroyed uh, my cardiovascular uh, abilities. Um, but before that, my FTP was 310. Um, after we're getting some numbers, but uh, I'm using a, uh, a trainer uh, for uh, like a, an in-house trainer for, uh, for uh, measuring the power and the numbers don't seem right. So I would guess probably somewhere around 250 to 270 right now is my FTP. Okay, interesting. Very cool. A lot of measurements, a lot of testing. Now, I'll just a yeah. few more fun questions now, the important mm -hmm. ones. First one, what's your favorite ride snack? What do you like eating when you're riding your bike? That's going to be probably your first. I like roasted crickets. You can buy them in Canada. Um, and they, they taste like chips. Um, they're super high in protein. And uh, nobody wants to uh, pick anything from your snack bags ever when you, when you have these things. So it's fantastic. Um, and number two, a tub of uh, peanut butter with a spoon in it. Wow. Uh, sounds very interesting. I've done a quick Google search of roasted crickets. That's right. See, there's a whole variety of them. Of course, these aren't crickets that you're just finding in your garden. No, no, no. <laughs> Bread. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when people want to try them, you know, I, I tried to discuss them a little bit just before, you know, like saying you really taste the antenna, um, but the, uh, uh, they're great. Uh, first, uh, they're, uh, uh, they're a very um, environmentally friendly source of, of protein. Mm -hmm. They're cheap. They're super light. So you got a lot of, uh, of protein for very limited weight, which is great. And they digest very well as well. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing that. Well, maybe perhaps you can create a, a nutritional product for sports uh, with crickets, some kind of cricket protein bar or something. <laughs> oh, there is one. Uh, it's actually from Quebec called the NAAK, N-A-A-K bar. Um, it's, uh, I've been writing uh, half of Transam uh, with this as my main snack. Afterwards, I would just ran out. And uh, it's great. It sticks in your stomach. Uh, you don't get hungry. Uh, I love it. Wow, that's super fascinating. Is this it? Yeah. Okay. Huh. Well, wow, looks tasty enough. <laughs> Don't see any crickets though. Good, good packaging. <laughs> yeah, they try to hide it now. <laughs> but well, they. I imagine, uh, I imagine they just probably grind them up as a powder, right, and put them in there as, a, you know, like a pea protein or a whey protein. I mean, you wouldn't exactly. Look Exactly. Yeah, it makes good sense. Yeah, very cool. I'll have to give that a, give that a try. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How about how about your favorite ride hydration? Uh, really interested here. Is there something normal here or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I use uh, those the uh, noon uh, caplets. Ah, um, that's pretty. I I I find them uh, really good. I know a lot of uh, your athletes uh, in previous uh, interviews are using the hammer nutrition stuff. In Canada, at least in, in Ontario and Quebec, we, we don't really get it. It's not widely distributed. So I haven't tried it, but yeah, I'm curious to, uh, to try it at some point. Um, this, uh, uh, sometimes I build my own electrolytes because they're pretty easy to build. But for uh, ease of transportation, I use the, uh, uh, the Noon. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, both products that you mentioned, both that Noon is also popular here. Hammer, of course, yeah find them at a lot of races and events and yeah, interesting that you don't get it over there. So I suppose when you're riding through the next time, then you'll have to pick some up and, and give it a try. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. 
you know, what's your favorite post ride meal? What, like, what do you like eating after a long, hard ride or race, or, you know, after a, a full day of riding in a multi-day event? I find it extremely hard to eat after any kind of event. My um, they, uh, cycling basically cuts my appetite completely. Um, so it's a bit of a struggle to get anything in. Um, so usually uh, because we're on the road, uh, I'll take from the, um, uh, from the gas station or you know, whatever is available, uh, milk and, uh, and, and a muffin. And that's pretty much it. But um, I cannot keep it down if I, if I have it after a race or even after a long day. Mm, yeah, a lot of us can relate with that. Okay, I love muffins also, although on races, I typically don't eat them. But if I'm just doing a casual ride or just having a cup of coffee, what's your favorite flavor of muffin? Um, bran and uh, oatmeal. Um, I do not like chocolate in general, uh, especially cooked chocolate. So, um, so I, I eat those for other people. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I like uh, I like blueberry muffins. Those are my favorite. Oh, that's good too. Yeah. Okay. So, how how tall are you, and how much do you weigh? Uh, I'm six three. Um, right now, I'm I'm way too heavy. I'm at uh, two hundred and eighty pounds. Uh, so I have to go back to two hundred five to be in uh, in race shape. Uh, last year has not been easy. So uh, so I gained a lot during that time. But uh, even during Trans Am in 2018, I was still uh, pretty heavy. I was at, uh, I started a race at 250 and I ended a race at 220. Wow. Um, fascinating. But e even then when I was in my 20s, I was doing bodybuilding and um, with the 8% body fat, that was at 207 pounds. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so all the muscle, it's its still there. It's just taking on a different shape. And once you get <laughs> one here, it'll just uh, get right back into place like an elastic band. Yeah, uh, I'm, 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 the family is all from Northern Quebec and uh, everybody is uh, naturally very strong. So, so I know it's there. Um, and um, I just need to uh, uh, remove the layers on top of it. <laughs> well, I'd imagine too, for the Trans Canada race, I mean, I'm sure it'll come in handy. Twelve thousand five hundred kilometers. It's almost eight thousand miles. Um, I wouldn't want to go too slim uh, into that kind of event. So it sounds like no. you're well prepared. <laughs> and there are there are segments where there is simply no uh, food, so you have to store a lot of food with you. the uh, The first uh, third of the event is where I uh, most of the um, of these very steep inclines, very long steep inclines are. So uh, uh, it's mostly muscle work until you get uh, to around the area of Canmore, uh, which is close to where in the back there in my image where the blue and the uh, uh, yeah. orangish yellow line uh, meet. Uh, that first segment there, it's gonna be rough. It's gonna be very difficult. Mm, yeah, yeah, looking forward to following that race. Now, next question I have for you. I mean, in the even Trans Canada, you're going to encounter so much terrain. So I'm wondering, what is your favorite? Do you prefer the climbs, the descents, the rollers, or the flat? Um, in order, I prefer the rollers. Uh, it fits my uh, my body type uh, more. Uh, number two, I like the climbs. Uh, I like the climbs a lot. Uh, in parts because uh, it's 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 far more difficult for me. So it requires more training, more psychology. Um, it requires like a nice uh, vibe also as you go up and I thoroughly dislike descents. Um, going down where everything is held by a tin wire, you know, to your brakes. And, uh, yeah. it's, it, it, it's more of a mechanical challenge than a physical one. And I don't trust necessarily, uh, uh consumer engineering to that degree. Mm. Very interesting perspective you have there. Uh, we may have to cut that out because if people have that perspective, they might reconsider riding their bikes down the hills if they really know how it's made. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if yeah. you look at the, uh, the accident uh, uh, um, logs, they're not happening very often on the sense, you know? So yeah. it's more of a, of a theoretical worry than a practical one, I would say. <laughs> yeah, no, it is true. In fact, 
I get quite worried after a few really hair raising incidences in my early years of cycling, they still stick around to me to this day. And when I'm going down to sense, I always think about my front tire blowing out like it did one time. And, uh, you know, once you have an experience like that, just the psychological aspect is hard to overcome. And, uh, yeah, you know, oh, yeah. I, always, I always prefer to err on the side of caution. And, you know, while we're on the topic of going downhill, now, I know you're kind of adverse to it, but what has been your max speed going down a hill? Do you know? Um, I used to have a job in France uh, where uh, in Grenoble uh, and Alpe d'Huez was uh, one of the mythical uh, climbs of Tour de France, uh, was a you know, very short uh, drive away from Grenoble. And uh, it was late at night. Uh, French drivers uh, are not uh, expecting cyclists late at night. Uh, in those in that specific area, so uh, I want to get out of there as soon as possible. I had a small cat eye computer at that point. Uh, it started doing uh, 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 flickering and not being able to show its numbers around uh, 107, 108 kilometers. So um, uh, I kept accelerating for a little while after that uh, on the way down, and um, then I realized that uh, even though it was extremely enjoyable. Uh, and fun uh, and exciting. Um, it was probably not very wise. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure it was fun to live a little bit for uh, that short amount of time, given that you did survive it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So you're in Toronto. You guys do yeah. get snow. For those who don't know, it's on the East coast of Canada north of the east coast of the u.s so places like new york or rhode island or washington dc so it does get some snow and otherwise has some pretty good weather year round when do you enjoy riding the most during the fall or, <clears throat> or summertime um i like any temperature between 5 and 15 degrees celsius that's where i'm most comfortable riding um so early spring is is when i really enjoy it the most uh, I'm not built, uh, probably genetically, because the old family comes from northern Quebec, uh, for, uh, for warm climates. Mm. Yeah, it's a challenge. So Trans-Canada in the route, and it's going to be mm -hmm. in June, starting in June. It's a very long race. Um, I'm imagining that you're going to be facing a lot of different uh, climates, temperatures, weather conditions, right? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, when we start, the nighttime temperatures will be between uh, minus two and five degrees Celsius, about um, nine to 12 degrees during the day. Um, and as we go down towards Vancouver, uh, we get into a nice west, you know, west coast microclimate, which is uh, a bit more humid uh, and, you know, in the 20s or so. Uh, as we cross the prairies, it's going to go really high. It's going to be, become extremely warm. And as we go towards the East Coast uh, with the saline air and, and the different winds, uh, it's going to be a little bit uh, uh, cooler. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be a wide mix. So people have to prepare for a variety of uh, of climates. Right. Yeah. Very exciting. Makes for a great uh, grand adventure. Okay. Mm -hmm. What time of day do you prefer riding? Training specifically. I'm a night rider. I prefer to ride at night. Uh, there's no cars. Um, you, I'm, I'm very curious by nature. So during those races, the, the thing that's most difficult for me is that if it was possible to stop everywhere, visit everything and meet everybody, I would do that. So uh, uh, I'm also a little bit ADHD. So, you know, uh, I'm excited by this and that, and I want to see this and maybe take a, a bifurcation and go somewhere else. Uh, at night, you don't get this. You get you get a dark tunnel with a light in front of you. Uh, it's great. Um, I seem to ride faster at night too, which is nice. Wow. Yeah, those are some good and interesting reasons. I will say that I also always love stopping and sightseeing, and I wish I could. I remember one time, short story with my wife, we went to visit Vancouver, Canada, which is on the West Coast and north of where I am currently in California. And I remember we were doing a short bicycle ride, just exploring around. And we were literally stopping every 10 feet for the first hour because we would roll a little bit and then we'd see something new. And it was just so beautiful and amazing. Oh, it's and, amazing, this area. 
Oh yeah, it's beautiful. Um, actually, I, I, there is one one place near uh, where uh, where you are, Justin. That that is just amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm in the tech industry, so I'm, I'm often in San Francisco, and just the, just across from the Golden Gate, the Marin Headlands. There are such a beautiful area. Uh, you're extremely lucky to uh, to have this in your in your backyard. You know. Oh yeah. Most definitely. Couldn't agree more. Love riding right there, especially when the weather's good. Now, you're talking about that. I do remember seeing a photo, I believe, of the Golden Gate Bridge or the Bay Bridge. Yeah. Oh, uh, there it is. Yeah, this one there. Um, I have a theory that it's it's physically impossible to take a bad picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, <laughs> I've tested it by just throwing a camera up in the air, and it still came out nice. I have no idea how your engineers did that, but it's it's a beautiful... Uh, bridge. This is a nice road that goes up, and uh, this is just before the point where uh, the road becomes very narrow and very, very um, uh, with a very nice steep uh, set of angles. Um, if you use uh, canty brakes, uh, you'll never get to a full stop. Uh, it's just so beautiful in this area. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. Very beautiful area indeed. Here it is. I've pulled it up on uh, Google Maps of San Francisco. If we zoom out first to give folks a context for what we're looking at, the United States, we'll look on the West Coast, California, zooming into the Bay Area, the Silicon Valley, which actually encompasses this whole bay. As you can see, San Francisco sits the very northern end. And the Golden Gate Bridge, of course, connects to the Marin Headlands, which you just mentioned. And you were taking that photo from just about there. And uh, I have ridden a number of times up that very steep road. It's very popular for tourists to also look at that exact photo that you're looking at, that beautiful view. And, of course, on the northern end, you also have Mount Tam. Oh, yeah. There. And you can see just from all the green there, a lot of mountainous terrain. So it's very enjoyable. And so that's cool. Yeah. Next time you're out in the area, would love to go on a ride together. Absolutely. That'd be fun. Nice. Um, I, I'm, I'm in the tech world and I'm pretty sure that if I lived in San Francisco, I would be on my bike more than in front of my computer. So uh, that probably would not be a successful uh, career choice, uh, but it's, it's such a beautiful area. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. That's so cool. Okay, so Louis, Eric, you have been an ultra cyclist for quite some time. You've, mm -hmm. of course, participated in Trans Am. You're getting ready to set off on this huge adventure, the Trans Canada race, which you're also organizing. What do you think? Does ultra cycling require more physical or mental training and strength? You need a base. You need a physical base for sure. Um, I came into Trans Am with, um, you know, a decent base to start with. Uh, of course, you can gain physical strength uh, and stamina as you uh, as you race, as you progress uh, on the course itself. So, but you do need um, a good base. I find that the more difficult part um, is uh, is preventing stoppage. Uh, it's uh, riding through uh, the emotional ups and downs, and uh, and just staying on the bike. And that part is more of a of a mental exercise. Um, when you're really lucky on a really good day, it transforms almost into a meditation of, of sorts and you don't, you don't see the miles going by. Um, but on some days you're not so lucky. So you have to, uh, to manage your, uh, uh, your focus, uh, accordingly. And that, that's, that's more of a difficult, uh, moment I would say. Mm, yeah. Well said. Very true. Okay. You've done a number of events also. What is your favorite event that you've done so far? Uh, in terms of scenery, the Italy Divide was amazing. Uh, every, every little bit, every little road is just so beautiful. But again, you want to stop everywhere and take pictures. So you cannot do that. Uh, and I decided that if I do Italy Divide again, uh, the first time I'll go at it with a, uh, a motorcycle. So I can uh, I can travel I can I can satisfy my curiosity, um, and uh, and then afterwards uh, race it on a bike, knowing that I've seen these places uh, properly before. Uh, I think that would be the the ideal recipe. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> a need for adventure, and of course, 
That was a lot of fun getting to know you. Now I'd love to dive into more topics in detail. First, of course, would love to know more about your backstory because from what I've seen and what I've read, you started as a kid. You did things like figure skating, high board, acrobatic diving. Mm-hmm. You had an accident. You actually broke your yeah. skin. I'd love to learn more about that, what had happened, and how that kind of catapulted you into even more sports, which also ended up including long distance ultra cycling. Yeah. Well, it's uh, uh, as an hyperactive kid, I really loved doing a lot of activity, a lot of exercise, a lot of, of sports. And um, uh, there was a pool uh, nearby where they were teaching uh, high board acrobatic diving. And um, I had registered not for one class, but for all three classes, which were back to back in the morning. So between breakfast and lunch, basically I had three classes. And uh, it was a little bit too much. Uh, and uh, one time on a third class of, uh, of the day, uh, on the way down, I lost consciousness. I, I just basically uh, blacked out and I hit the bottom. Uh, I had a C4, C5 uh, unstable fracture uh, in the neck. Um, I was admitted to the Montreal uh, Children's Hospital. I was, uh, I was 12. And uh, uh, the doctor there looked at the, uh, at the charts. And um, I, was, I asked him a few questions like, how long will I be here? When can I get out? And he said, well, son, likely never. So I said, what do you mean? said wow. you'll never walk again hmm. and i said never is not it's not an answer i like you know what are the odds and he says wait i'll be back he goes to the nurse's station pulls out some numbers and he comes back he says your odds of walking again are one in 997 and um, i said how'd you get to that he said well 996 kids came before you um and they never walked again so if it is, wow. if you get that chance, then you'll be the first. So your odds are one in 997. I said, well, I'll, I'll take that chance if I can. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, I was um, immobilized for uh, quite a while. Um, being hyperactive, one thing which is uh, unique is that a lot of stimulants calm you down. A lot of, uh, of uh, neurodepressors will stimulate you. So if I want to calm down, I have a coffee, for example, which is uh, not the, the case for most people. Uh, so they gave me um, uh, two big pills to basically um, force me to fall asleep. And what they presume would happen at that point is that the, uh, the, the, the matter that's in the spine itself, which, is, which has about a consistency of a wet Kleenex, uh, would simply shear off. And I would wake up... Uh, without the ability to move my limbs. And um, instead what it did, it woke me up big time. uh, And I relaxed every single part of every single fiber of my body until there would be some tingles or a lack of sensation. So either an unusual sensation or a lack of sensation, my extremities. And and if that was happening, I would reverse the motion uh, until I felt completely safe. And this allowed me to deposit um, my spine directly on the mattress um, in a way that was safe. And I could, I could basically be saved from the process of shearing, which was the problem that was happening at that point. Um, so that was um, extremely lucky. Um, I still have weird abilities due to that, moving stuff that in your body that nobody can usually move, you know? So uh, it makes my girlfriend laugh a lot. So I can move a, a nostril separately or okay as long as that's all we're talking little, <laughs> or just like a little part of of my finger that should not move you know uh, all by itself uh so it's always uh it's a party trick now but it was very useful at that point that's that's a pretty cool story yeah. but where are you today with that i mean in your recovery any kind of symptoms that you still may have from that nothing uh nothing at all um, I w- didn't want to have a, um, a bad impression of altitude after that event uh, because gravity is, you know, was the culprit at that point, you know, uh, well, apart from uh, me pushing too hard. 
So I still wanted to enjoy verticality, the, um, the area between the ground and the sky. So uh, I started doing uh, mountaineering and skydiving to simply transform what a memory of something which could have been negative into a fun play zone, basically, uh, uh, in vertical spaces. Um, one thing which was pretty unique during that moment, and I feel like I was almost uh, reborn in a way during that time, uh, was listening to people's stories around you. You know, hmm. uh, a nurse would say, oh, you know, if only had more time, I would do this and I would do that. And I made a decision that uh, no matter what, um, after I came back from that, I would make it possible to do uh, all of these things and not have excuses not to do them. Hmm. Um, and that kind of frees you because basically what happens after that is that every day is, is a bit of a gift. And uh, like any good gift, you don't want to waste it. You know, you want to voraciously bite into it and, and enjoy it and explore it. Um, and, uh, but also you receive it as a moment that should not be, which is, which is phenomenal. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of, of physical limitations, there's nothing. Uh, the bone is actually stronger now because of that fracture. So uh, my neck is a little bit straighter than it should be, but that's pretty much the only side effect. Yeah, pretty incredible. What an astounding life event that was. And so glad that we're able to chat here today. You lived to talk about it all these years later. And you are mm -hmm. a very fascinating man in part due to that and all that adversity that you came through. And I think that's a great theme of even ultra cycling and an event like Trans Canada or Ram or Trans Am. It's mm -hmm. that you start one way and you come out the other end uh, by choice, really, uh, a totally different person, especially if you keep going and you keep persevering. So it sounds Absolutely. like your whole life was kind of set up for you to be an ultra cyclist and then to be an ultra cyclist and everything else that you do with that ultra endurance mindset and paradigm. So that's right. interesting. And, and also a choice of career is like, I'm a software entrepreneur. That's what I do. I start businesses, I build things. And it's a long process, the end of which you do not see, but you know is there, and uh, over which you solve a series of problems. So um, I would say that in a way, my sports and leisure activities are kind of similar to my professional activities. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but yeah, you're very right. Uh, you, uh, you are in a loop of solving small and big problems as you go along. And it's actually very fun you know most of the things that happened during trans i would never have expected on the day uh that we started the event itself um and but you learn to uh, uh to fix them as you go yeah give us give us some context give us some ideas and examples of what you faced oh uh so many of them. There is one, uh, it's more of a fun story. I'll start with a fun story and I'll tell you after the one. Um, I never really seen a bear in my life uh, until Trans Am. And um, there was a, a big climb up uh, and I forget the name of that climb, but it was, it was, uh, it was in a forested area. And um, I was listening to a good podcast. I have um, the, uh, the, the uh, Air Shocks uh, bone conduction uh, headphones to listen to music, podcasts, uh, take courses uh, when I ride. But in the back there of, of my of, of my side, there was like a kind of a black mass. And there was a rider next to me or close to me, at least on the map, that was dressed in black. So I was just assuming this was uh, that rider. And I thought, I really, I'm really enjoying my podcast right now. I just want to focus on it. I don't necessarily want to interact. Not that I usually don't want to, but on this case, you know, I really enjoyed uh, that specific podcast. Usually I like chatting with people. Um, so, uh, but also a climb, you know, we, we're in a competition. So I thought maybe I'm going to cut uh, his motivation a little bit. You know, I'm going to do some acceleration spurts and try to uh, tire him out. And uh, he's still following. And um, it goes on for quite a while. And after a while, I don't see that in the corner of my eye anymore. And there's a guy in a pickup truck who, who's coming down and says, hey, good job with the grizzly. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, well, you were followed up the hill with, by a grizzly. 
And at that moment, I was kind of jealous of him because he had seen a grizzly. I didn't, you know, so it was an occasion to see one. And I just never saw it. So uh, those are, uh, this is kind of a funny event that was happening. Um, in, in one case, uh, uh, I'm in uh, probably Missouri or Kansas. Um, I forget where. It becomes a blur after a while. Um, and uh, there is a huge storm uh, passing by. And um, I got to go quickly uh, into the nearest uh, shelter uh, because the, uh, you know, there's a lot of, of tree limbs and stuff like this floating through the air. Uh, that's after deciding not to go with the wind because it was going in the right direction, by the way. So uh, I stopped by this small motel and uh, it was, uh, the night was cheap. It was like something like 30 bucks. Um, but I wanted to have a king size bed just because I'm, I'm taller. Uh, and uh, I started negotiating with a girl and she knows I'm a captive customer. There's, there's no way I'm leaving from this place, you know, but she still gave me a better price. Uh, for that night, and it turned out to be uh, the room uh, that was used by um, a local long-term resident uh, of the uh, of the facility, who was entertaining multiple clients every night. Um, so the place was uh, was filled with uh, a variety of perfumes and sticky substances. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> uh, stuff like that. Um, there was uh, the moment in Italy where I had to fix a Garmin computer uh, by going into uh, a store. Um, during, there was, there was a part of Italy divide which was going through Leroyca, which is a beautiful path. Um, it's, uh, it's a narrow uh, path at the top of, of cliffs and you have like beautiful scenery all around. And uh, I'd been riding for two days uh, straight. And I was hoping that what I thought was a hotel uh, would be uh, open and would have room available uh, to be able to sleep at. And uh, it turned out that it was closed. It was under renovations. And so um, um, I found uh, one of the workmen uh, there and I said, hey, uh, do you mind if I use a bit of the grass in front of your, uh, of your establishment so I can pitch my tent there and sleep there? He says, well, why don't you, why don't you come with us? Uh, we have space in our, uh, in our house, so you can sleep there. And uh, you end up making those uh, incredible encounters as you go, you know? Mm -hmm. But the, the problem is you're still in race mode, you know? It would be a, a fantastic and deeper, more meaningful encounter, but you got to go, you know? So it was, uh, it was a short, uh, short event. Hmm. That's very cool, though. Thanks for sharing those stories. A lot of fun, though. <laughs> Sure, there'll be even more of those in the Trans Canada, given the length of it. And so, I mean, Trans Canada, 12,500 kilometers, almost 8,000 miles. Trans Am is about what half of that, right? Uh, a little bit more than half, about 60%. Yeah. Oh. Mm. Yeah, pretty yeah. amazing. And you did actually send through a photo that has a nice image here of on the map. And uh, was this a tracker when you were doing it in 2018? No, this was a, um, a, a map that was considered for, uh, with a deviation through uh, Nebraska uh, for the 2020 race. Uh, so it was the start of the race uh, with that deviation in place. Uh, previously, uh, Trans Am would, uh, uh, would go through Kansas, which is a wonderful windy uh, area, which I love. I love the wind. I love the headwinds, especially. Um, and uh, now they were going through a different uh, different course. Yeah, I did actually, let's see, this one, 2020. So I guess this one looked a little, looks closer to what you did then, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You did on Ride with GPS here. Okay, to give folks an idea of what you were riding. And again, through Kansas there, which people who have done the Race Across America would be very familiar with. Uh, I, I'm not sure, actually, I've never analyzed the route, but it looks very, very similar. I'm trying to see Alamosa, that sounds familiar. Colorado Springs, yeah, and then going into Missouri. Springfield, that sounds familiar. Yeah, very cool. And of course, we could see here f about 4,200 miles and 180,000 feet 
of elevation gain. So it's it's really good. It's a huge event. I mean, Race Across America is only 3,000 miles. And just to think that Trans-Canada is even longer and more climbed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the spirit of that is I want it to be uh, the absolute capstone race in one's ultra cycling career. Uh, unless Russia decides to make a longer national race, because it's only it's the only bigger country in terms of land mass uh, than Canada. Canada will remain uh, the longest, uh, most difficult uh, ultra cycling race in the world. So it has to be, it's one of those things that you have to do. Uh, some, you know, it has to be in your bucket list somewhere to at least do it once. Um, and that's the, that's the purpose. Um, it is, I've had multiple requests to make it easier, shorter, faster. Um, but I, I don't want to. I want this to remain the longest, hardest bike race in the world. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Very fascinating, I must say, Louis Eric. So here we have the full route of Trans Canada Bike Race 2021. And we could see it's a grueling 7,800 miles thereabouts and over 300,000 feet of climbing, which is just insane. So it starts all the way up here. Tell me about the start and end locations. So Yukon is the uh, northern. So uh, Canada has 10 provinces and, and, and three territories. Uh, Yukon is one of the territories. It's only a legal uh, difference between a province and a uh, territory in terms of, of what they can do. But it's a bit uh, analogous to a state in the, in the States and a, um, in a territory like Puerto Rico, for example. So um, it, is, uh, it is under federal regulation with uh, some, some level of, of territorial uh, control. Um, but it is basically the northernmost uh, large city in in uh, in uh, the west coast of Canada. Um, it is a uh, it is a mining town. It is uh, it is a hunting town. Uh, it is a very wild, savage, but uh, very well organized little city. And all around you are absolutely stunning terrains and 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 verdant mountains with uh, with almost nobody. So we're leaving from there. Oh. Uh, then we're going down uh, the Rockies all the way to Vancouver. And on the map, you'll see a dip around uh, the 2,500 kilometer. And that's Vancouver. Um, and, uh, but all the way there, it's, uh, it's undulations. The map seems a little bit harsher than the elevation map on the graph simply because it is compressed horizontally. Um, there are a few really difficult climbs, you know, at, uh, there is one at 15%, that's at uh, any one location, but usually they're still very approachable in terms of, of hills, just a lot of them. And, um, but going into uh, Vancouver, you get this, this beautiful wilderness that most Canadians have never actually seen because it is, uh, the population of Canada is mostly located close to the, uh, as, as much south as possible, which kind of makes sense. Uh, for, uh, you know, climate uh, reasons and also for trading uh, reasons. So going north is, is rather unusual for Canadians. Uh, so most of that route will be completely new territory, even for people who lived here in the country all of their life. Uh, you have uh, rivers, you have uh, beautiful mountaintops, uh, glaciers, uh, all the way uh, into British Columbia. And uh, you end up in, in, you know, the... The, you, you saw it, the, the beautiful city of Vancouver, where, again, one of the difficulties will be not to stop everywhere to take pictures and enjoy uh, the local uh, city, you know, uh, because right afterwards, you're going back into that, that wilderness. Uh, they're all paved roads. You know, I want to make sure that we're not um, paved roads or very packed uh, little pebbles uh, for cycling, for cycle paths. Uh, whenever possible, I make sure that people can go through the cycling path, so the race actually goes through uh, the existing cycling infrastructure to uh, minimize as much as possible uh, time spent on the road itself, especially uh, because many of these uh, these paths are made to be uh, beautiful, you know, so might as well have uh, some enjoyment uh, visually as, as you go through that. Um, and they also tend to be closer to a lot of resupply options. Hmm. Now, I'm really curious. 
How long did it take you to put together this route? <laughs> I was super naive when I started. After Transime, I thought, hey, that'd be cool to have this in Canada, but we, we don't have it. So I'll take a few hours and I'll do some research. And uh, ended up taking uh, close to a thousand hours uh, of work. Um, it's a lot of, of calling, uh, you know, local bike clubs, uh, local uh, police enforcement to figure out what's the safest way to go from point A to point B in all of these, uh, of these locations. Uh, calling uh, city halls all over the place to make them aware that uh, we're be gonna, we're be, uh, we'll be going through uh, their, uh, their cities. Uh, part of that is also organization for the following year. I wanted to do this this year, but with a pandemic, it's not possible. Uh, I want to have a relay race happening between cities that they will organize themselves. So we, we give them the ability to, uh, to ride alongside us and um, they can use that to, um, to raise funds for the local sports teams uh, like softball and, uh, and hockey and, uh, and simply raise funds for the clubs. So, uh, but it's going to be a national event in a way, you know, so uh, it gives them more of a reason to go and collect funds from the local citizens uh, for their own sports teams. Uh, so I had to call a lot of city halls and, and see who, uh, who would be a good stakeholder to get a hold of to make this possible. Uh, but that's work ahead for the following year uh, if we're done with, uh, uh, with, the, with the pandemic, with the plague, you know? Mm. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a very interesting concept that you have developing. And especially for such a long route, it kind of makes sense to try to do something like that. So very cool. Looking forward. I wish I could take credit, but it was my girlfriend's idea. Oh, no way. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, to be, to be accurate, uh, you're now fiance, right? Yes. As of last Monday. Wow. Yeah. Big congratulations to you on that. To Thank you, you both, in fact. And I know we do have a few photographs here. In fact, right here below the map. Uh, is this her right here? Yeah. Right. So, uh, uh, with the red coat, uh, she comes with me uh, on cycling adventures once uh, once in a while. Uh, she's not uh, as crazy for distance as I am, so she'll do 75, 95 kilometers, which is uh, quite a lot already. And um, when she gets tired, I find uh, we find her a taxi, or uh, I knock at somebody's door and uh, offer them some money for uh, for a ride to wherever we're gonna sleep. And uh, so she accompanies me in, my, in uh, my adventures. The first time we rode together, we went into a territory on the northern side of the St. Lawrence River in Quebec, uh, which is not heavily populated. And I was so worried, it was our first trip together. And I was so worried that I, uh, she's about 97 pounds. Um, and uh, I think I brought probably half of her body weight in gels and chocolates to make sure that she would not uh, perish, you know, during the, the event. I think she ate one bar of that wow that's that's crazy <laughs> but that's so cool that she is able to enjoy that with you and i'm sure mm -hmm. she gives you a lot of support as you mentioned she did she has been helping even with trans canada and a lot of that organization so that's fantastic like they yeah. say behind every great man or next to every great man is an even greater woman and so i could just imagine who she is to you and of course you have proposed and you two are engaged. So there must be yes. something right there. Very exciting. <laughs> she, now, she's by far the smartest uh, person I've met in my life. And that's, uh, that's one of, the, of her beautiful qualities. Uh, she has a heart of gold. Uh, we go well, we go very well together. When I'm, when I'm gone for these races, she's totally happy to have her own life you know, by herself. She doesn't need uh, my company. But, you know, I call every day and uh, we talk during those events. That's so cool. Now, for TransCanada, you will be riding yourself here in the inaugural race that you are organizing. Yes. Will she be able to meet you anywhere or will she just be following from the comfort of home on the dot walk? <laughs> if everything works well, uh, you never know because, uh, you know, uh, work uh, that she has to do. Um, she may be able to take some time off so we can go and, uh, visit uh, Yukon together. So she'll be there at the start. And for the rest of it, she'll see me on the tracker. And the tracker, uh, we're not using only uh, GPS devices that connect with satellites. So the Garmin uh, devices or uh, 
the old alarm devices, for example, uh, the spots, we actually have an app running at the same time that uh, gives uh, also a second recording of, um, of the path that racers took. And that gives us kind of a, of a fun possibility. In all of these races, you're not supposed to ever stop your tracker because it could be an invitation, even though there's nothing to win. You know, he goes, might get involved. Um, it might be an occasion to cover ground, you know, while you're uh, uh, under power other than your own. So, uh, but it, it creates kind of a problem, especially for people who feel more vulnerable sleeping in the wild uh, and broadcasting their position. So we're going to allow people within a certain distance, I think it's uh, five or 10 kilometers of their sleeping location, to shut down their public tracker. And their, uh, the private app that's ringing on their phone will tell us where they are, you know, but uh, they'll have some privacy while they sleep. Wow, that's fantastic. Great addition. I'm sure it'll be very welcome by all of your participants and those who become aware of your event. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. How many participants do you expect to have showing up at the starting line for this inaugural race? Event? It's really hard to tell, mostly because of the pandemic. Uh, some countries will restrict travel. Um, so basically, we're allowing something which I think we're the only race that allows this uh, right now. If you register for 2021, uh, for any reason whatsoever, if you choose to instead attend 2022, uh, we give you uh, in the user dashboard, a place to just switch yourself to the next year. So if, for example, you're blocked um, at your departure uh, gate, you know, because of new regulations by uh, country XYZ, uh, then, uh, you know, you cannot attend, you're not losing uh, your registration. Um, if you feel sick, uh, you're not losing your registration. You can, you can just choose whichever you want. So uh, right now we have close to 100 people registered. Um, how many of them will show up uh, on June 21st of 2021 uh, is unknown. I'm expecting at least half of these people to be able to attend 2021. Mm, fantastic. Yeah, that'll be a lot of fun to watch then. And I know there will be countless stories and memories to share after. Are you aware of any documentaries or anything like that that will be made by any of these guests? Yeah, uh, one guest told me about a media team that uh, may want to cover him. Um, I have a team uh, as well. We're, we're trying to find the financing to make such a long uh, expedition uh, turn into a documentary. So that's, uh, that's underway as well. Um, and uh, they will choose, uh, of course, a, a number of people uh, to, uh, to showcase in that documentary. Uh, we have uh, we have help from established uh, directors uh, in that field. Um, I don't want to name them yet because they're uh, uh, they're uh, confidential at this point, but they're very well known uh, people in that sport. So um, if we can make that happen, I think that's going to make a really fun documentary as well. Yeah, and I mean, I think I can speak for probably everyone watching. All of us as ultra cycling fanatics, I would say, is fair to say that uh, it would be very exciting to see what Trans Canada has to offer. I mean, I can only imagine I've been to, you know, a few places, including uh, Vancouver. And I know just even in that little pocket of Canada, there's so much beauty and of course, untouched mother nature. So I could just imagine yeah. going Yukon going all the way to the East coast over such a long distance. There'd be just so much to see. Right. If you, uh, you see the, the pictures uh, on the East coast, there are roads that are, basically attached to the base of, uh, of the cliffs of the land that's there. Uh, it's absolutely magnificent. Yeah. Going back to the photos, I mean, there are just, mm -hmm. many, I think some are probably of perhaps what your trans am. Some of them are from the route, some in Canada, some in the U S yeah, a very nice collection. I'd like to pause at this photo here because of course, for those who are familiar with bikepacking and multi-day adventures, I mean, this is a, a common setup. Now, I have not done anything like this of this nature. So whenever I see the setups, both on the Facebook groups, the bicycle touring, you know, for people who are doing things like PBP or, you know, perhaps Trans Am or Trans Canada, mm -hmm. it's just uh, fascinating to see what people come up with. 
So tell me and all of us about what you've got here. And I'm guessing this is your bicycle, right? Yeah, it is a heavier setup. This is a touring setup. It's not the one that I would recommend for a race situation. Um, every, uh, every year until the pandemic, I would uh, basically take a month off and uh, bring my business on the road, uh, work from there, put my laptop, um, spare batteries, uh, and everything I need to be able to do my, uh, my business and manage uh, the staff uh, from the road itself. So uh, it has way more than is necessary. It's more for a comfort ride than it is for, uh, for performance. Um, you'll see in the front there is a little uh, flap that's uh, um, opened. And uh, that's a, those are loudspeakers, so I can listen to music as I go. Um, in the uh, frame of the bike itself, I coiled some uh, copper and uh, remnants of a... Um, of a uh, cell phone booster that are used by truckers on their trucks. Uh, so I can amplify cell signal in, in regions where that is not so available, so I can keep working. Um, but this one is a, is a comfort setup. Um, I'm carrying way too much clothes. Uh, on the race like Trans Am, I basically had one kit and I mailed myself a kit in the middle of the country so I could have at least a change of clothes. Um, but uh, yeah, this is, this is a... Uh, this is a comfort situation. And you'll notice like underneath the seat there, there is a mountain bike um, uh, specific uh, shock absorber uh, to just make the roads, especially the rougher ones, uh, way more comfortable. Wow, very cool. Yeah, very nice setup. I'm sure a lot of experience and time goes into something like that. Yeah. And I see another photograph here now and it seems to be a uh, slightly less luxurious uh, setup. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, midway, no, about three quarters maybe of the way in Illinois during Trans Am. Um, I'm in front of the Popeye, the Popeye statue, um, which is uh, kind of odd because uh, uh, the character was actually drawn and invented uh, in Illinois, which is a uh, mostly landlocked uh, state. Uh, and features a sailor as its main hero. Uh, so I stopped there and I took a picture, uh, at least uh, somebody from the area took a picture. Um, it's, a, it's a much lighter uh, system. Um, like the other bike, it has a generator uh, in the front. I use a, a Son uh, 28 as a generator. Uh, it comes to underneath the uh, top bottle there that you see, that's a tri tri uh, triathlon bike uh, bottle the Iro something, I forget what it's called. Um, underneath there is my uh, power to USB converter. Uh, there's a little red cache battery. There's a little blue speaker. I always uh, carry uh, bone conduction uh, earphones uh, with me so I can listen to music, podcasts. I even take uh, classes online while I'm writing. Um, and uh, uh, when that gets out of juice, basically, then I have that little blue speaker uh, to keep accompanying me. Uh, uh, and give me sunny courage uh, during those events. Um, I thought when I started Trans Am that I had minimized everything. Mm -hmm. But honestly, if I was to do this again, I would probably be able to be able to cut at least a third of what's there and be even more uh, efficient. Hmm, interesting. I guess that's one of the fun things. And it sounds like you are the kind of person that would be uh, so fascinated and, uh, and uh, just... Uh, entrenched in these kinds of things, strategizing and optimizing and figuring out how best to go about things. So I'm curious to see once you set off on your Trans Canada ride coming up in a few months, what your setup will look like there. <laughs> well, I'm doing a lot of, of custom stuff. So for example, uh, on this race on the Trans Am, I was using bags that were made uh, that were commercially available. Um, I'm making my own bags uh, for, uh, for the upcoming event, um, taking more of the aerodynamics in context and also having more organized storage so that, you know, if you're looking for, um, you know, a small component to repair something on the road that you can find it uh, easily, even in the dark, uh, without having to fish through the bags themselves. Um, this is, there's there's going to be a lot of, uh, of small things like this. Um, in one of the pictures uh, you'll see, I've also built uh, using uh, a piece of CAD software and a 3D printer, um, uh, lamp holders that go on the helmet. 
uh, and allow us to attach. So you see there in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I see some of these CAD uh, designs here. Yeah. And here on the helmet, I see two different photos. So this is a, a light. Yeah. So uh, basically, I use a Radbot 1000 light, which I love because uh, well, first it, it uses very uh, low amounts of energy. So those two batteries last a long time. But if it dies, there's still a good reflector built in uh, into the light itself. Uh, I'm modifying those, replacing the battery with uh, a lithium ion uh, battery and uh, reworking the circuit a little bit uh, of this commercial component, make it more uh, my own. Um, and it attaches to the back of my helmet. Uh, I find it actually balances out well on the helmet. You, uh, you have a bit less neck pain because you have this weight kind of projecting a little bit backwards, you know, it kind of helps. Um, and, um, uh, but the, uh, the way it's attached to the helmet, I could not find this on the market. So basically I just designed my own. Uh, and I, I invite cyclists to go ahead and do that. You don't have to buy everything. It's, it's pretty easy to learn how to do CAD modeling like this. Uh, some companies like Autodesk will even offer hobbyist free software. Uh, so you can do it yourself. It's, uh, uh, and this is to hold uh, my uh, top mounted light. So it uses a Garmin mount at the bottom, a Phoenix 86 light um, on the top, but the cage that holds it together uh, is custom made uh, so that it holds the light really, really well. It doesn't bounce around, you know, so, uh, but it will still, if I happen to fall um, and, and take a direct hit on it, it'll still break safely so that I, don't end up with a flashlight embedded in my, in my cranium, you know? So, uh, so it has the, the right uh, safety elements as well. Yeah. Very fascinating. And I'm again, as I am not a tour uh, touring rider myself or bike packer, at least not yet in my young life, I, I can't, uh, I, I'm not sure how um, creative other riders are, but from what I could tell following different Facebook posts and other things, it does seem like it is kind of part of the nature and personality and persona of these kinds of writers. Would you say that's an accurate statement? Oh, absolutely. Uh, from the ridiculous focus on weight, uh, for example, so everything has to be super light. Uh, before the start of Trans Am, uh, there was a thread where people were comparing uh, how light they could make their toothbrush, you know, mm -hmm. how, how much of the handle they could cut off to save a few grams. Um, uh, on my bike, I did a few things. So most people carry a multi-tool. And uh, I figured out that the, uh, the heads of most of these screws could be standardized to a three millimeter wrench. So I didn't have to carry a whole uh, multi-tool uh, for the events. And three millimeters is kind of the perfect uh, dimension because it is also the size of the wrenches you can find at Ikea, for example, uh, and it'll give you one uh, if you ask uh, nicely. So you can, uh, if you lose your tools or if they're damaged, can, you can find those basically anywhere. Um, and I don't have to carry a variety of sizes. It makes repairs faster on the side of the road because I know that, you know, when I make contact with that screw, I'm always going to get a good fix on it. Um, so little things like that, people get very obsessive about these things. Uh, I'm building my own uh, bottle uh, holding systems uh, simply because it's gonna be more aerodynamic and lighter and also will be able to uh, carry more uh, fluids, especially uh, in the areas where there is not a lot of uh, civilization. Uh, it is not necessary, but it is fun to do and a lot of people really enjoy doing that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really awesome. Again, look forward to hearing about all the stories coming out of Trans Canada this year. And well, we'll see. Perhaps one day in my life I will participate. It sounds like a lot of fun and a grand adventure, but wow, what a trek. And like you said, a capstone for a cyclist's career. So perhaps I have another 20 years or so before. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll, you'll have to do it twice, you know, once to, uh, to get a feel for it and once to optimize. So, uh, and you're definitely welcome. And in, in, I was thinking you know, in those events. perhaps maybe maybe four times then because one from the west coast to the east coast and then why not the opposite direction <laughs> uh the opposite so traveling towards the east coast um 
I met a lot of, uh, of tourers who would do the opposite, go east to west. And I noticed a huge difference. People going from west to east had a beautiful smile on their face. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of the prevailing winds and the fact that it's a low gradient that never ends, uh, there was a um, almost like a death mask quality to the people going east to west. Um, so uh, I, would, I would not recommend, uh, unless you really like uh, uh, self-punishment. All right, so maybe that is the final ride that an ultrasound <laughs> can go away. And once they get to the very end, they'll drop dead happily that they've completed the most difficult ride, ride, ride that they could ever do. <laughs> right. <laughs> very fascinating. Of course, um, you know, folks could go online and check out the race for themselves. Uh, I'd imagine there's still time to register if someone was interested. Absolutely. Um, on the, on the side that you see right there, I made it accessible to people who both like metric and uh, imperial measurements. So if you actually click on any number, like the number of miles at the top, it switches from miles to kilometers and we'll remember it next time you, you come and visit. Uh, so you can make your calculations more easily that way. Um, yeah, uh, register uh, anytime you want. Uh, you'll need to have enough time to register for your tracker before the start of the, of the event. Uh, track leaders, uh, our tracking partners are being very flexible about this. They, I'm sorry, they do expect that uh, you will bring your own tracker because rentals would probably be as expensive as the cost of the device itself. Um, so uh, on, on a long course like this, usually rentals are good for races that are uh, below, uh, below a month of, uh, of length. So um, they need to be able to uh, put them put uh, your ID and, uh, and enrich your tracker in their system, well, they'll do it very quickly, which is uh, very appreciated uh, of them. And uh, so even if you decide uh, two or three days before the event that you want to make your way uh, to the start line and, and come with us, you can do that. Mm, yeah, very cool. Definitely is an accessible and well-organized website. And on there, I did notice that you are offering two different kinds of formats. One is the competitive one, which we have been talking about, uh, just mm -hmm. under 1,000 miles. But there is also a non-competitive touring option. How long is that? That's one? right. So uh, this is uh, about three quarters of the length. Uh, so we skip Vancouver and we go straight uh, into Alberta from uh, Yukon. And uh, so it, it saves a lot of the difficulties. It's mostly for people who would like to participate in such an adventure, but don't necessarily feel ready to do it uh, in a competitive way. Although there is absolutely nothing that prevents somebody who wants to do it competitively, realize that maybe they, you know, a bit more than they could chew, uh, to complete the rest of it in touring mode. We have plenty of time to do it. There is only one cutoff time, which is important, which is you must be in Calgary, which is, um, uh, a little past that junction in the back there between my blue and orange line uh, by the end of July. And the reason for this is that uh, with climate change, uh, forest fires tend to be common um, starting in, at the end of the first week of August uh, in the West Coast. And I want people to be safely out of that uh, area uh, by the time this happens. But end of July to reach that uh, is a very leisurely pace. You know, it'd be somebody who took 50 days to do one quarter of, uh, of the path. So it's plenty of time to do it. Um, I expect people uh, who are at the tip of the race to be there probably on day nine or 10 of, uh, of the race itself. Mm, fascinating. So what do you expect in terms of the leaders? How much time will it take them to traverse the entire course? Now, oh, that's, uh, that's a bit of a, of a guess. And it's a guess for multiple reasons. Um, in the prairies, you have strong winds in your back throughout. And even people who are not trained to be racers or just tourers mention days that are insane in length just because the wind carries you uh, for a long uh, part of, of, of that road. So uh, there's going to be moments like in the, in the Rockies, it's going to be slow moving simply because you have a lot of ascension. Uh, and the prairie is going to be faster. There's, a, there's a, an area which will be psychologically difficult. Uh, I don't know if you can uh, load the main map. I'll show you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So just uh, above the Great Lakes there, 
uh, going towards, yeah. So yeah, you see it there near uh, mm -hmm. Lake uh, Superior when it starts going up there. So between, uh, or even actually more, if you go towards Winnipeg, which is a uh, top left of your map there. Yep. Yeah, right there. Um, going towards uh, Sudbury, which is uh, about three quarters of the screen towards the right. Um, that area, it's a forested area. There is nothing but beautiful vistas and trees around you and a few towns here and there. Uh, there are places on the map where I say, look, this is your last point at which to buy any kind of supplies. Because if you don't have it with you, you'll have to hunt it yourself, um, which I don't recommend. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, we're indicating this is the last gas station, this last convenience store, supermarket, uh, or even restaurant that you're going to see for the next uh, 200 kilometers, so about 120 miles. So uh, do make uh, resupply there. That's going to be more of a, a psychological challenge like we discussed before. Physically, it's very simple. It's a very flat area. Uh, it's around the lake, so by definition, it's going to be flat. Um, and... Um, I'm looking at the screen, sorry, on the other side there where, where my map is. Um, so it's mostly getting your discipline uh, in place, not stopping, making sure you got your full resupplies uh, and that you're doing uh, as long as possible distances uh, using the opportunity of very flat land uh, and almost no winds and in most instances because you're surrounded by forests um, to, uh, to move forward. So that's gonna be the more psychological component. And then from Toronto onwards, it's just beautiful scenery after beautiful scenery until the end, which you've really earned by the time you get there, you know, so. Mm. Yeah, I could imagine. It'll be great to see the Atlantic Ocean. Oh yeah. Now, I see here, so it looks like it is all skirting here along the land and it gets to this point now. Do you have to take a ferry or is this a bridge that goes across from there here? Is a, there is a ferry. There are, right now, there are four. We may introduce a fifth ferry uh, into the race itself. Uh, there is one just a little bit to the left. You see Prince Edward Island, um, which makes a loop. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a very nice, beautiful area. Uh, it may be a little bit quaint, but uh, the people of the area are very proud of it. Uh, if you read... Anne of Green Gables and Anne of Avonlea. That's usually something you were assigned to in high school. Um, that's where uh, it was filmed uh, and written. Um, so you have to take a shuttle, uh, a bus shuttle to go there. And there are some areas where the waterway is just too wide to build a bridge and there's not enough traffic. So there is a, um, um, a, uh, a boat shuttle that you have to take. And to go towards the last uh, province, which is Newfoundland, you have to take a very long shuttle. Uh, it has a schedule that varies wildly from two to, I think, four boats a day. Um, it can take on a good day, seven hours to, uh, to cross uh, that strait. Um, and on a, uh, on, a, on a bad sea day, uh, 12 to 15 hours, if the boat has some difficulty making uh, uh, its way. So it's going to be interesting because you're going to see a lot of different strategies that people will, will take at that point in the race. Um, some will want to give it all they got, knowing that they'll have anywhere between seven and maybe 15 hours of rest uh, before the last segment of the race. So we might see people who will uh, race two or three days without sleep at the end uh, to get uh, to that point, uh, which makes it more of a challenge as a race organizer because I have to find the very safest uh, routes uh, possible so that if somebody is tired, uh, we can give them the best chances uh, at safety in the process. So, uh, and, uh, and of course, even when you get to that, uh, to that boat, you have two choices. You know, you can buy the, the cheaper ticket and have a, have a bench somewhere to, uh, to sleep on. Uh, or you can actually hire yourself a cabin for extra luxury for, I think it's 50 bucks extra. Uh, and, uh, and have like a more private uh, sleeping experience as you go there. So uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be interesting. It's going to change the dynamics a bit uh, towards the end. It's going to make it very exciting. Um, and uh, yeah, it's going to give people a chance to self-organize the way they think is best for themselves. 
Yeah, sounds like a lot of fun, a grand adventure. And like you said, a lot of strategy making. Uh, back to my question, perhaps I'll reframe frame it. What is your best guess at a time frame? Oh, first racers will actually come in. I'm guessing the tip of the spear will be there in 33 to 36 days. Um, however, I'm getting messages from uh, racers uh, who uh, uh, participants who, who feel they'll do much better than that. And, and I, I really hope they can because that would be athletically an awesome, legendary thing to be able to do that in the kind of short times that they're talking about. Uh, uh, and I think they, they desire any kind of admiration uh, for uh, the performance that they're aiming for. Um, so hopefully they'll be able to do it. Yeah, I can imagine. How about yourself? You'll be participating. What's your goal? Yeah. I'm aiming for 50 to 55 days to do uh, the whole event. Um, so I'm not going to be at the front. I'm still too heavy to be at the front, honestly, and under trained. I'm still carrying the damage from COVID itself. So on the first year, uh, my goal is to complete in 50 to 55 days and, uh, and maybe compete in future editions. Hmm, yeah, very exciting. So from a rough calculation, so I guess it'll be 150 plus miles a day minimum at least, but I'm sure your strategy will vary. So you'll be doing many more miles on, on some days. Yeah, yeah. Even that, it's it's very doable. Uh, we've seen people in the last few years like um, uh, Abdullah Zainab, uh, who's packing on 500 to 600 kilometer days so divide by 1.4 for uh, miles, I'm not sure, um, which is kind of insane, you know? Uh, and he does it day after day after day, you know? Uh, the man is a machine. Um, so we're seeing more and more of these athletes that can optimize to such a level that he can do these, these humongous distances and still be fine to race the next day without additional recovery. And that requires a lot of training um, and a lot of discipline as well. So um, uh, that's why, you know, uh, I'm hopeful that uh, we can eventually uh, go below 30 days for um, the final results uh, in the top uh, in the top five. Yeah, it's going to be very exciting to watch. So thanks for organizing <laughs> such an adventure for all of the ultra cyclists around the world. I can just imagine that there'll be so much coming out of this in terms of stories and memories. Oh, yeah. Well, it's one of two events that I'm organizing, right? So there is, um, I wanted to have not only the hardest race, but the funnest race. Funniest, funnest, I don't know how to say it in English, but the most enjoyable, the most fun one. Um, and so we've been working with uh, the local uh, diplomats from Cuba to organize the race around Cuba, which is going to be, yeah, so which is going to be a 3,500 to 4,000 kilometer race uh, on uniquely flat land. Like it's, it's, it shows here uh, high uh, uh, altitude gains, but if you look on, on the scale itself, it's minimal. It's slight ground undulations. Uh, it's going to be in the tropics under uh, the tropical sun, the ex extremely friendly people of Cuba. Um, and, you know, if you, if you want to uh, fuel with carbs, um, they have uh, plenty of excellent rum along the way as well. So that's going to be uh, the fun, uh, the fun event, you know, the, the opposite. So one is more of a dopamine centered, let's fix problems, let's move forwards, let's have discipline. And the other one will be more of a serotonin centric event of let's, uh, let's be highly performant, but have a lot of fun in the process. Um, for people who want to recover, on the Cuban uh, race, we're indicating also salsa schools where they can go and uh, <laughs> spend half an hour, dance a little bit, uh, shake uh, their muscles uh, off a little bit, uh, their lactic acid away, and then move on, you know? Oh. So, uh, so that's going to be a fun adventure as well. Right. And earlier before the show, we were briefly chatting. I asked you the question, and I think it's worth uh, sharing again. Why Cuba? What is your connection there? Uh, so, Cuba and Canada have a lot of, uh, of history together. Um, it's, uh, it's a country which, well, because of the embargo, 
uh, with the United States, uh, has tried to develop its tourism and um, has, doing, has done very well doing that. It's a very enjoyable place, a very safe place uh, to visit. Um, and so for Canadians, it is uh, one of the two most common go-to places to go uh, avoid being here in winter. So uh, Dominican Republic and Cuba are usually where Canadians go if they cannot go to Florida, for example, if, uh, if, they have, uh, if they're a bit older in terms of, of, of age, they tend to have more of a property in Florida. Um, and they're called snowbirds, uh, the people who go there. Um, so Cuba, you can get for almost nothing, flights, hotels, meals, all-inclusive experience, all you can drink, alcohol as well, um, and spend maybe a few hundred dollars to go spend a week over there, everything included. Uh, so it's a very pleasant place, very accessible place for everybody to go from Canada. It's a short flight as well from most of the Eastern seaboard. Um, and uh, it's a place that welcomes uh, tourism very well. The safety aspect is amazing. The safety part, uh, uh, you can fall asleep with your bike, which is a bit like in, in, uh, in parts of, of Canada as well. You can sleep, you know, fall asleep with your bike next to you. Uh, even if you had some valuables next to you, you'll wake up and everything will be there. You know, it's a, it's a very safe place uh, to be in. The nice thing is that uh, even though there is a U.S. embargo in Cuba, there are multiple, I think it's 18 discrete reasons um, that allow an American to have an exemption and go and visit Cuba. And one of them is to have a, an athletic event uh, that they wish to participate in. So that allows Americans to go to Cuba as well, which is not something they can typically do uh, because of the uh, local politics. It's, um, and people are incredibly friendly. Uh, it's, a, it's a sunny place in more ways than one. Mm. That's pretty cool. And when can we expect that event to be launching? What, what, what is the date? Is there one already? Uh, by the end of February, the, uh, the event will be formally announced. Uh, and the, the, the start, uh, the, the Grand Départ will be on the 1st of February, 2022. So it's going to have, it, we're going to have one event that you have to train for, uh, for the whole year to be able to do, which is a Trans Canada, um, and one that you can uh, complete your training in by attending uh, in the winter as well. Hmm. Yeah, sounds nice, actually. My birthday is February 25th, so perhaps it's a good birthday present for myself. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> birthday. Uh, <Yeah. laughs> and the, uh, the Cubans uh, are extremely supportive of the event. Uh, oh. We told uh, one way in which we, we always want to make a bit of a difference uh, in the events that are organized. Uh, we, not myself, but I mean, in terms of the general uh, ethos of, uh, of race organizers in, in, in ultra cycling. So uh, in a case of Cuba, uh, we will make the event freely accessible to all Cubans. So if they want to register, they'll have no fees. And right now, I'm, I'm not sure if I'll be able to, but I'm, I'm knocking at many doors to try to get some cycling kits uh, for people to, uh, to use during that race as well, so that they can start developing their uh, their own ultra cycling um, uh, local athletes. Wow, that sounds great. Yeah, sounds like something we can all support and be excited about. So thanks for all that you're doing for the ultra cycling world uh, all around the world, quite frankly, as I'm sure there are going to be participants coming from all kinds of countries and oh, yes. Canada and also the race around Cuba. Look forward to mm -hmm. following those. And then, you know, perhaps having you back on the show uh, once the Race Around Cuba is fully launched and there's more details to share. And then I later, love that. after we have the first participants of both events, it'd be great to have them uh, on the show to hear about their experiences and see how it lines up with how you've planned very carefully and strategically the routes of both of those races. Right. Well, you know, the, uh, there is a military expression. I'm probably going to mangle it. Uh, that says uh, no plans uh, survive contact with the with the uh, uh, the with the um, usually they say enemy, but in this case I don't want to say enemy because they're not you know they're competitors, so they're not enemies. Uh, so let's make let's make it uh, no no plan survives contact with the ground. Um, so I think my best guesses as to how you know how long it's going to take people to do it are going to be completely wrong, uh, and and I think I'll be pleasantly surprised in the process. Yeah. 
you and all of us as well as we continue to watch. Louis, Eric, it's been a lot of fun chatting. Have a few final questions to conclude our session here. And I know we'll have you back on the show again soon, uh, perhaps even to hear about your experience of riding your own race. That'll be a lot of fun as well. Mm -hmm. The question I have is just, what do you think most people don't realize about ultra cycling, uh, whether it's a, a non-cyclist or just a non-ultra cyclist? There's, there's, there's a few things. One of them is, for some reason, people do expect that because you're doing this, you're doing a fundraiser event of some kind, because it must be a self-punishing thing. Uh, it is really a lot of fun. Uh, uh, you'll see one racer, which I think she, uh, she's uh, emblematic of uh, the community, Lael Wilcox. Lael Wilcox. Um, it's impossible to take a picture of her just not having this huge beaming smile and enjoying the best days of her life uh, on the bike. Uh, you see this with Al Russell as well, uh, the elderly gentleman from Texas. Uh, and you see it uh, all across the races. Uh, it's fun. It is, it is not this uh, serious, stoic, self-discipline uh, thing, which is part of it, but it is not it. The, um, the absolutely pleasurable aspects of it are uh, almost impossible to describe. You know, it changes uh, your mindset. It changes what you feel that you can do uh, in life uh, when you've crossed a, a continent, you know, uh, by your own power and by your own wits. Um, uh, it is also a source of, of, of so many adventures and stories that you will unfortunately never be able to tell to your friends because unless they do it, they will never really understand uh, the, uh, the deep pleasure uh, in doing it. Sometimes when you finish a race, people will, will ask you, so how was it? And they expect like a three word answer. Oh, it was great, you know, but that's not, that's not a complete uh, description, not even close, you know, uh, right. even the low parts are wonderful. Yeah. So true. Yeah. It just makes me think about all the adventures that I've been on. And I'm sure those who are listening in or watching, bringing back all those fond memories. And it's been difficult with the pandemic to get out to live events and races. A lot have been canceled. And so it's great just to hear about these stories, adventures, and the possibilities coming up this year and next year for these races that you'll be putting on. I think something to look forward to as everything starts opening up. So, uh, Louis, Eric, what are your tips for people wanting to get started with ultra cycling? Uh, take any bike you got, and I'm going to be very precise about this. You want to enjoy being in the moment on a bike and not do arithmetic as you're moving forward. You know, you don't want to be in the mindset of calculating, oh, you know, I have maybe seven hours of physical energy left and there's uh 51 kilometers left. And so I must do this at this specific speed, you know, um, that takes you out of the moment. So focus not necessarily on stamina, uh, but on the sheer pleasure of just being on the road, on the bike and enjoying a good time. Um, rack up the kilometers. That's going to be important. Uh, do it uh, not only when it's nice out, but also when it's rainy and uh, when it's less pleasant. Uh, so you can also find a pleasure in it um, and ride which, whichever bike um, satisfies your fancy. So for some people, it's going to be any old bike. Some people are gear geeks and they will want to optimize and have that specific derailleur and that specific frame, those specific wheels. If that turns you on, do that as well. It doesn't need to be a cheap bike. It can be any bike that uh, makes you want to ride it. Mm. Those are some great tips. I love all of them. And uh, especially about, uh, you know, geeking out over the gear. <laughs> That's one of the <laughs> fun parts of the sport, of course. Absolutely. Okay. Final two questions I have for you. And uh, it's sad to conclude such a fun and adventurous conversation, looking at these races and chatting with you, a very interesting person. But I know we'll have you back on the show. So to conclude here, of course, would love to know how would you rate yourself in terms of bicycle maintenance? I, I my guess is on the higher end, but on a scale of one to ten, ten being exceptional, where would you put yourself? Uh, 
on the main stuff, a seven. Uh, so I cannot assemble my own wheel because I simply have never done that. Uh, but I did train to uh, quickly replace the wires on a bike from the side of the road, for example, and fix uh, almost anything that can be fixable from the side of the road uh, myself, simply because you have to be autonomous in those races as much as possible. You can use bike shops, but sometimes there are just no bike shops available. Um, so uh, I do a lot of the work myself, not particularly fast. Um, uh, when I go to a bike shop, I'm amazed at the speed at which they do uh, repairs that take me about three times the amount of time to do myself um, uh, and the precision with which you do it. So I would say a, a seven. That's awesome. That's a really stellar number. I mean, just compared to the averages on the show, probably say about a three or four. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, final question I have for you. Mm -hmm. Who do you want to nominate for a future episode on this show? You know, another story that, that has inspired you or one that you think is worth sharing? It's difficult to recommend one because I know of, of three people would be absolutely amazing for your show. So can I, can I extend the invitation towards uh, yeah. three names? Sure. All right. Um, there is a lady that we worked with, uh, Dr. Erin Ayala. Uh, she is a psychologist who is focusing her career on opening up uh, cycling to communities and groups of people who are not traditional participants uh, in cycling. And she was um, uh, extremely helpful in making our race accessible and friendly to everybody. So for example, some, mm -hmm. some women will not participate in the race for fear of uh, being found at night and, and being a victim. Uh, even though the likelihood of that happening either in Cuba or Canada is extremely low, it is, it is a concern because they do have it. So uh, we made some adjustments based on her advice. She would be an amazing guest to have. Um, there is a, a lady who did the race, uh, the Trans Am, uh, uh, in 2018. Uh, she has a thick Austrian accent, and so we called her the Terminator, uh, until we recognized that it would be somewhat unfair to the Terminator. She's really tough. Uh, Tanya Hacker, and she's also organizing the Austrian uh, Extreme Race. Uh, which is another bikepacking event. Um, and the third person is, uh, is a very fun, easygoing uh, gentleman uh, that I, I, I love following uh, what he does. I, I know him well, uh, Tom Hughes. Uh, Tom used to live in, uh, in Kentucky, uh, moved to uh, Oregon, and uh, he loves uh, ultra cycling so much that he, carry, uh, he uh, visited every... I think it's a major road in Kentucky and, uh, and tagged every summit uh, in the last few weeks before he left the state to move to Oregon. Um, he's also one of the rare uh, people in this, uh, in this world of ultra cycling who races, uh, I want to say vegetarian or maybe it's vegan. Uh, I'm not sure to which degree he takes it, but uh, he manages to find uh, the proper food and sustenance throughout all of these events. Um, if, uh, all three people would be fascinating guests to have. Yeah, sounds like it. Thanks for your nominations. Look forward to having them on the show, hearing about all of their stories. I can just imagine coming from you that uh, they have very interesting stories as well. But for this episode, Louis, Eric, Tamar, thank you so much for your time. It's been such a pleasure being able to speak with you, learn about your events. And I really genuinely look forward to seeing how the Trans-Canada race, the inaugural race of this year plays out and looking forward to your own progress in that journey. I'll be watching closely. Thanks for taking a, time to chat with us. It was a very fun interview. I, I'm amazed and people don't see what you're doing uh, off of, uh, of the video, but how uh, well you are organized and how professional you are. Uh, in organizing these, uh, these conversations. It's a lot of work that I don't think people see, but uh, clearly shows in the product that you create. So it was, it was very enjoyable. Well, thank you very much. And I must say that I approach this just like an ultra cycling event and a race. There's a lot of strategy making, a lot of fun adventures, and uh, that's all part of it. And 
So I'm glad that this could be of value to you and hopefully also your current and even future participants who end up signing up for your events. I do highly encourage them to check out uh, your race trans Canada bike race.com. And of course, soon to be announced will be the race around Cuba. And we will make it a point to have you back on the show to feature that and also other uh, racers that participate. So everybody stay tuned until next episode, everyone keep spinning ultra. Ultra.